Uh, all right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Hi again. Uh, you know, if you have uh, just joined, uh, welcome to this this program. Our next and uh, final speaker for today is, is Tom Hutchcroft. Uh, Tom is currently at the at the University of Cambridge, where he's a, he's a junior research fellow at the Trinity College. Uh, Tom obtained his PhD uh, from UBC in 2017. Uh, he's a provost working on a number of different topics. In particular, he has been a, a key influential figure in the in the recent revival of the study of population on, on general background geometries, uh, resolving many decades old open problems. Uh, Tom has, of course, received uh, many awards and honors, uh, too many to name uh, uh, right now, but uh, notably the Rollo Davidson Prize in 2019. So we are very happy to have Tom deliver a series of four lectures on the topic of percolation on non amenable groups, old and new. Um, so this is the first lecture. So over to you, Tom. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thanks, and thanks for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so, uh, so I want to start today by just reviewing a lot of a bunch of basic things in percolation, or basic and not so basic, sort of classical background stuff, and then we'll be able to get into more new stuff um, in in the in the next three lectures. Okay, so, um, just to start. Um, so what is percolation? So it's going to be a random subgraph of some given ambient graph. Okay, so generally speaking, we'll be interested in transitive graphs where you can map uh, one vertex to another by some symmetry of the graph. But the most basic assumption that we will always be making is that our background graph G, uh, so we'll always call our background graph G and the vertex set and edge set will always be B and E. And we'll always take this to be a connected graph that's locally finite, meaning that all degrees are finite. Okay, and you know, usually we'll even say that it's transitive, so all the degrees are the same. Okay. Now, um, what's percolation? Well, uh, we fix some parameter p, which is between zero and one, and then what we do is we flip a coin independently for each edge of the graph G, uh, and every uh, that has a probability of p of being heads, we delete every edge where we see a tails and we keep every edge where we see a head. Okay. So um, the standard sort of jargon of the field is that the edges that we keep we call open and the edges that we delete we call closed. Okay. And we'll, do, we'll denote the law of this random subgraph with density p by this blackboard bold p subgraph p and similarly expectations for name. Okay. And generally speaking, what we're interested in understanding, so we get this random subgraph from percolating, and we'd like to understand what do the connected components of this random subgraph look like? And how does this depend on the parameter P? Okay. And um, uh, this, another p standard piece of jargon is that these connected components of the random subgraph we get, we call clusters. Okay. So um, maybe just to very briefly say something about where why people started studying percolation. So originally, uh, Broadbent and Hammersley in the 50s started considering it as a model of some kind of random porous medium. So I think they were actually specifically interested in gas masks or something like that. But basically, you imagine you have some kind of stone that has some little holes in it that are sort of randomly distributed. And you want to understand, you know, as the stone gets more and more porous, as you get a higher density of these little holes, how how does that help fluid uh, flow through the stone? Say, for example, if you're making coffee and, uh, and then you push the grounds into the thing before you put it in the machine, and the, the harder you push, the more difficult it is for the water to get from the bottom to the top. And um, the sort of phenomena uh, that come up this, you might model using percolation. Okay. Um, so, as I said, I want to start by just uh, over being some basic stuff. Um, so one basic thing is, so as I as I defined it so far, uh, I told you for each p, here's how you define the newly bond percolation with parameter p. Okay? But a very basic thing that's useful to use a lot of the time is that we can put all of these different percolation processes with different parameters on one big probability space. Okay, and the way we do this. Is very simple. We just um, 
take a uniform zero one random variables independently for every edge, right, these UEs, and then for each P, we define omega P to be the indicator that U is smaller than P. Okay, so the point of this construction is we get this one big probability space with all these independent labels, and whenever we do this kind of mutation at level P, we get a copy of the newly P bond population. And the, all these copies are monotone. So as I increase P, more edges appear. Okay. So one um, immediate consequence of this is that if I take any event A, which is increasing, meaning that if I have some configuration that belongs to A, and then I can add edges to it, and A still holds, then uh, for any increasing event, the probability that A occurs will be an increasing function. It's this density of powers of P. So, for example, A might be the event that X is connected to Y by an open path, or it might be the event that X belongs to an infinite cluster, or there exists an infinite cluster, all these sort of things. Okay. Um, another basic fact about increasing events, which we'll use a lot, is uh, called the Harris FKG inequality. And it says that increasing events are positively correlated with each other. Okay. So, this is a property of product measures like. So if, if you have any two increasing events, then the probability that they both occur is at least the product of their product measures. Okay. And of course, this also holds if A and B are both decreasing by a certain period. Okay. Now, um, the first kind of basic interesting thing about percolation, which underlies a lot of the interest in the model, is that it undergoes a phase transition, typically. Um, so suppose we have an infinite graph. And we define the critical probability, PC, of the graph to be the infimal value of P, where there exists an infinite cluster with positive probability. Okay. Now, in fact, this event that there exists an infinite cluster is a tail event of all these independent Bernoulli random variables, and therefore, by common bar of zero one law, it's a zero one event. So, in fact, once we know that this probability is positive, it must actually be one. Okay. And um, we say that a graph has a non-trivial phase transition if this critical probability is strictly between zero and one. Okay, so in this case, we really get these two phases. So for small p, there are no infinite clusters almost surely, and then for large p, there exists at least one. Okay. Now, as I said, this turns out to be a pretty generic behavior for infinite graphs, um, with the main counterexamples being things that are safe. Uh, one dimensional in some sense. Okay, so one thing you can prove very easily is that the critical probability PC is always at least one over the maximum of the degree of the graph minus one. So in particular, if G is any bounded degree graph, then PC is positive. Okay, and this is actually an equality on a regular tree. Um, so the proof is really easy. So let's define N to be the maximum degree. Then, if we look at the number of simple paths of length n starting at some vertex v, so you know, what I just mean, a simple path is a path that doesn't visit any vertex more than once. Um, well, the number of such paths is at most m times m minus one to the n minus one, right? Because the first step, you get m at most m choices, right? And then at every subsequent step, you have the most m minus one choices because you can't go back. So in general, this is a very coarse bound. It's true. Okay. Now, by Markov's inequality, right? If I take any simple path like this, the probability that all the edges in the path are open is just p to the n by infinity. Right? So the expected number of open paths of length n, I can bound by m times n minus one to the n minus one times p to the n. Okay. So, so this is a bound on the expected number of paths. So it's also an upper bound on the probability that there is a, that there exists at least one such path. Okay, and of course, if p is smaller than one over m minus one, then this goes to zero as n tends to infinity. Okay. But if we had a positive probability to have an infinite cluster starting, at, uh, including this vertex, well, if you have an infinite cluster including the vertex, then you certainly have a path of infinite length including the vertex. So we deduce that if P is smaller than one over M minus one, then 
there are no imposters on my shop. Okay, and then that's that concludes. Okay, so this uh, showing that critical probabilities are not zero is easy. Showing that they're not one is in general much harder, and you need to actually use some ideas of the graph to do it. So um, so of course, the most practical setting to study this problems is on Euclidean lattices like the hypercubic lattice. Right? So ZD, where uh, just to remind you, Z, uh, there's a standard abusive notation that we use ZD both to denote the actual set of D tuples of integers and the standard nearest neighbor graph on them, where X and Y are connected if they differ in exactly one coordinate by exactly one. Okay. Now, um, so it's a it's a very uh, classical argument that when you're in dimension of these two, you have a phase transition for percolation on cubic classes. Um, in, in, in fact, you can easily prove this inequality that PC is always at most two thirds. Okay. Now, why is this? Well. First of all, it suffices to consider the case d equals two by monotonicity, right? Because uh, z squared is the subgraph of z to the d with d bigger than three, and if I have an infinite cluster inside a population on the subgraph, I certainly have one in the in the big graph as well. Okay, so it suffices to consider the case d equals two, and then what we do is we notice well, uh, so z squared is planar in that gives us a lot of extra tools we can play with. So what we notice is that suppose the cluster at the origin is finite. Okay, so maybe this is the origin here, and these blue edges are the open edges that belong to the cluster at the origin. So um, what I must see is that the boundary of the cluster at the origin must compose of all these red closed edges, right? And what you see is that if you look at the dual, the edges of the dual lattice that go perpendicular to these red closed edges in the boundary of the cluster at the origin, what you see is this purple cycle, this dual cycle going around the origin where all the edges that this dual cycle crosses are closed in the, in the prime. Okay, so we call this a dual circuit of closed edges. Okay, now what we can notice is that there are at most three to the n times n dual circuits of length n surrounding the origin. Why is that? Well, each such circuit must cross the x-axis somewhere, and it has to cross it in the first n places because otherwise it wouldn't have time to wrap around the origin. Okay, so I get this factor of n here, uh, counting for the number of choices of the where I intercept the positive x-axis. But now, once I've told you what the where the x-axis intercept is, well, then there are at most three to the n dual circuits that intercept there because you know I have that that edge given that intercept, and then I just have to choose which of the three options do I go in at each stage of the path. And of course, again, this is really a very crude upper bound, um, but it's but it's an upper bound and it's not okay. Um, so what we get is that if P is bigger than two thirds, so if I give you one of these dual paths, right, then what I need in order for it to possibly bound the cluster of the origin is that all the edges that it crosses are closed. Okay. So again, just as in the proof we just saw, we have these two competing exponentials and we get that if P is bigger than two thirds, and the expected number of closed dual circuits surrounding the origin is finite. Okay. Now, once you have that, well, we've learned in particular that the number of dual closed circuits that surround the origin is finite in my trolley. And from there, it's not too hard to see that there's some positive probability that the origin is not uh, is not surrounded by any closed dual circuit. Right? Because, for example, if I take a big box. Have a good probability that there are no dual circuits surrounding that big box, uh, but then I can also just make everything inside that box open. Okay, so we get that when p is bigger than two thirds, um, there must be 
a positive probability that the origin is not encircled by any dual circuit, which is the same as saying that it belongs to anything. And uh, one remark on this proof. So this is a very simple instance of something that's generally called the Piles argument. It comes from the Ising model originally. Um, so one remark is that you can actually get a version of this to prove, prove to work on any finite Kelly graph of a finitely presented group uh, with one end. So it's not completely obvious perhaps, but you can make that work and that was done by Ising Benjamin. Now, in fact, in this particular case of the square lattice, it's a famous theorem of Harry Keston from 1980 that the critical probability is exactly equal to a half. And this ascent ultimately comes from the fact that the dual of the square lattice is the square lattice. So there's self-duality in the model, which leads to PC becoming a half. Okay. Um, now, this is a nice and important theorem. Um, but if you're new to percolation, you might get the wrong impression from it because in general, we don't expect to be able to compute PC exactly in most examples, and we don't expect it to have an interesting value. So for example, if you look at the cubic grid, nobody has any conjectures of what this number should be. There's no reason to believe that it would be an algebraic number. Okay. Now, um, this uh, course is mostly going to be about, not about Euclidean examples, but about non-amenable examples, so ventilation, hyperbolic spaces, and things like that. Okay. Um, so uh, what, what does it mean to be non-amenable? Uh, so we say that a graph is non-amenable if it has positive Chiga constant, where the Chiga constant of the graph is defined to be the worst boundary to volume ratio of a finite set. So uh, concretely, you take the infimum over all finite sets of vertices of the ratio of the number of edges in the boundary of the set, i.e. edges that have one endpoint inside the set, one endpoint outside the set, divided by the volume of the set where we measure the volume using the degrees, so uh, the sum of the degrees in the set. Okay, so again, if this Chiga constant is non amenable, sorry, if the Chiga constant is positive, we call the graph non amenable. If it's zero, we call it amenable. Okay, so for example, um, if you take a Euclidean lattice, it's amenable because if you take a big box with side length n, right, its volume grows like n to the d, but its boundary size only grows like n to the d minus one. And so as the box gets bigger and bigger, this ratio is going to zero, and we see that set D is amenable. Okay. On the other hand, you have something like a three regular tree where it's not too hard to see that this Chiga constant is positive, i.e., if you have any finite set of vertices, its boundary has to be at least some constant times its volume. Okay. And of course, there's a huge variety of examples of non amenable graphs, so you also have all versions of the hyperbolic. Plane or higher dimensional hyperbolic spaces, you have products of all these things, you have, you know, epsilon Z matrix group Kelly graphs, you know, that, that there's a huge variety of things you can look at. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very, very uh, general notion. Okay, and being non amenable is also the uh, infinite graph analog of being an expander graph. So if you work in or something like that, you might be more familiar with the notion of expanded graphs. Non amenability is just the infinite one. Okay, so uh, these non amenable graphs, one nice thing about them is that it's quite easy to prove that PC is strictly less than one. Okay, so they, they always have a phase transition. Okay, and there are lots of proofs of this. In fact, we'll probably implicitly see a bunch more proofs in the remainder of this. Um, was. Uh, let me show you a, a nice proof gen due to Benjaminian strand that has a nice advantage that it gives a pretty good quantitative estimate on PC that will be useful for some things in a bit. So 
uh, this proposition says that if you have any k regular non amenable graph, not necessarily transitive, then PC is bounded by from above by one minus the degree times the chief constant, which of course is, is strictly less than one if G is non amenable. Okay. So, so here's the idea. Um, what we do is we, we're going to think about, and th this is an idea that will often be useful later on as well. We want to consider exploring the cluster of the origin in some sequential fashion. We, we look at one edge and then we see whether it's open or not. And if it's open, we know that its other endpoint is also going to belong to the cluster of the origin. Otherwise, it's closed and we don't know either way necessarily. And you know, we we're going to keep going one step at a time, looking at edges, growing the revealed cluster at the origin, looking at some more edges and so on. So the way this works is we fix an enumeration of the set of edges. And then at each step, we're going to let En, so En is going to be the edge that we look at at step N. We define it to be the minimum element, minimal element of E, so with respect to this enumeration with the properties that it has exactly one endpoint in the revealed part of the cluster of the origin, and we haven't already looked at it, okay? Uh, so for example, maybe, maybe the origin is here, and then we look at, so let's say it has some edges going on like that. Okay, maybe let's just label them. So, okay, so, so we'd first look at this edge labeled one here. Uh, maybe we find that that's open. So now we know that these two vertices both belong to the cluster of the origin. Okay, then the next edge we look at, well, we want to look at the lowest numbered edge, which has exactly one point endpoint in the cluster. We haven't looked at it yet. Let's say it's this, well, it's this edge too. So um, let's say we find that it's closed. Okay, so now we, um, we don't know whether this vertex here is going to belong to the cluster of the origin or not. Uh, so now the next one we're going to look at is this one labeled five, right, and, and so on. So maybe you find that this is open. Now this belongs to the cluster of the origin. And it's actually, you keep exploring uh, the cluster of the origin in this way. Now, um, the nice thing that happens here when you do this is that the if you look at the, um, the sequence of whether the edges that you explore are open or closed, this is just an IID sequence of some random length. Okay? Because at each step, you don't know anything about whether or not the next edge you look at is going to be open or closed. Right? You know things about some other edges, but all these edges are independent. Okay? So this sequence has the same distribution as just some random, uh, some IID sequence of Really random variables, which is just stopped at some random time. This time is also going to be a stopping time for that sequence because, well, if I gave you the sequence of coin flips in advance, you could tell me exactly what's going to happen in your, in your expression algorithm. You'll stop when you reveal the whole cluster of the origin, which is a function of the coin flips you've been given up until that. Okay. Um, so this is nice. And uh, moreover, what, what do we get at the end of this procedure? Well, what we explore is, first of all, the only open edges that we see actually are a spanning tree of the cluster at the origin, right? Because the way we defined it here, we're never going to look at an edge. If we already know that both the endpoints belong to the cluster at the origin, we're just never going to look at that edge. We don't care about it. Okay, so the only open edge we, edges we ever reveal are going to be some spanning tree of the cluster of the origin. And what about the closed edges? Well, these come in two flavors. So we're certainly going to reveal every closed edge that belongs to the boundary of the cluster, right? Because um, you know, we uh, otherwise we wouldn't have known that it was time to stop. Um, and we might also reveal some additional closed edges that don't belong to the boundary of the cluster, but actually have both endpoints inside the cluster of the origin. Okay. 
So if we look at what happened here, well, first of all, the number of revealed open edges, well, if I have a, a tree on n vertices, then it has n minus one edges. So the number of revealed open edges is just the number of vertices in the cluster of the origin minus one, in particular, it's less than the number of vertices in the cluster of the origin. What about the number of revealed closed edges? Well, it's at least the size of this boundary. As we said, we certainly explore all the closed edges that are in the boundary of the cluster of the origin. We may explore some extra ones as well. Okay. So that means that the revealed closed edges at least the size of this boundary, which by the definition of the Chi constant is at least H times the sum of the degrees in this set, which is because the graph is regular, it's just K times the size of the set. Um, so the point is that um, we're forced to have this, at least this proportion of closed edges versus open edges when we when we do this expression, provided that the cluster that we find is finite. Okay. Um, so in particular, if we take P to be larger than one over one plus H times K, um, then, uh, well, we get with positive probabilities. Suppose they take an infinite sequence of coin flips with this parameter P, okay? Then I have with positive probability that if I look at the average of these coin flips up to some time, right? So this average, you know, converges to uh, P, which is larger than this. So we get with positive probability that this is actually larger. This all these averages are larger than this number for every n. Okay. Now, if that event happens, and I've sampled my calculation configuration using these coin flips, then I can just never have that the number of revealed closed edges is more than HK times the number of revealed open edges. Right? But this is saying that if I find a finite cluster, then that has to be the case. Right? So of course, I learned that I must have found an infinite. Okay. And I think, actually, I wrote this wrong with this one. So this is a, a nice argument, um, and it, it's actually a little bit more clever than it seems because this trick of uh, not exploring open edges that have both endpoints already in the cluster uh, is not a completely obvious thing to do, and it actually optimizes the argument quite a lot. So we'll, we'll see in a bit that this specific bound uh, turns out to be very helpful for some, some things um, uh, later on. Okay, so we now know that at least in our primary setting of non-amenable uh, transitive graphs, say, we always have a non-trivial phase transition. So when P is small, there are no infinite clusters. When P is close to one, there's at least one infinite cluster. Now, the next move main thing is going to be to start investigating the question of how many infinite clusters we have in the supercritical. Before I get onto that though, I want to talk uh, quickly about another uh, important thing in percolation, which is just about general transitive graphs. And it's one of the most important general characteristics of percolation. It's called the sharpness of the phase transition. So, this is something that was um, open for a long time. Uh, they, you know, between the, the early 60s or so when people first started working on these things until uh, the, the mid 80s or something like that when, when it was solved. And um, it was solved first. So in, in the case of uh, Euclidean graphs, it was solved by Menshikov, although his proof doesn't generalize so well to other settings. And then uh, around the same time by Eisenman and Barsky, so usually considered to be uh, due to both of them. Okay, and what, what this theorem says is that if you're below PC, so of course, by definition, you know that the cluster of the origin is finite almost surely. 
Hegel, what the theorem says is that not only is it finite and surely, but in fact, its expectation is finite as well. So by the way, I'm always going to use K like this to mean the cluster of the origin. So this is just the expected volume of the cluster of the origin. And just to note some more jargon, because I'm probably going to end up using it, this expectation of the, of the volume of the cluster of the origin is called the susceptibility. So the theorem says that once you're below PC, that you have finite expected cluster size. And in fact, um, moreover, you, you even get that the probability that the cluster of the origin is large is decaying exponentially. In, in. Okay. Um, so the original proofs of this were fairly involved. Luckily for us, there was a much simpler proof covered I think in 2015 by uh, Dimlo and Tassi. So I can show you how that goes. And this, is, this is very key. Okay, so it, it all kind of comes down to a trick. So what they're going to do, so for each finite set of vertices S and P between zero and one, we define phi P of S to be the following quantity. So we have a factor of P, and then we look at the sum of edges in the, Oriented boundary of S. So, uh, by, so, so even though we can, even though all our graphs are unoriented graphs, it's often convenient notationally to use oriented notation. So we can think of each unoriented edge as being a pair of oriented edges going in opposite directions. And this oriented edge boundary of S, we define to be the set of oriented edges whose uh, start point is inside us and the end point is outside us. So we're going to sum over this oriented edge boundary of the probability that the origin, so we just fix some origin vertex, the choice doesn't matter, um, that the origin is connected to the start of E inside the set S. In other words, we have some open path of, of edges that all of whose endpoints belong to this set S. Okay, so maybe S is like a box, you're looking at, you have this edge sticking out of it, and you want to know the probability that you're connected to the start points inside the box. Okay. Now what they do is they define, uh, they define a, a new version of the critical parameter, which we're going to show is actually equal to the standard critical parameter. We define held PC to be the supremal value of P, such that there exists some set, finite set containing the origin with phi P of S strictly less than one. Okay, so what we'll show is that till PC, till PC is actually equal to PC, and when we're below till PC, we have the sharpness that we want. We have the, the expected size of the cluster of the origin is finite. Okay, so um, in order to show you, before, before I show you how that works, uh, let me introduce another uh, basic tool in calculation that we'll use a bunch of times in the future as well, uh, which is something called the BK inequality. Um, before telling you what the BK inequality is, I need to tell you about the notion of uh, witnesses and disjoint witnesses. Um, so suppose I have some, some event um, A, okay, and that I have a population configuration that belongs to A. Okay, so given these two things, I say that a set of edges W is a witness for A. If, if I tell you what Omega looks like restricted to W, then you know that A is a curve. Okay, so for example, A could be the event that X is connected to Y, and W, uh, uh, an, an example of a witness for that event would just be an open path connecting from X to Y. Okay, and of course, there might be multiple such witnesses. And if, I, if I'm given two events A and B, I define uh, this A circle B, which is called the disjoint occurrence 
to A and B, to be the event that A and B both occur and there exists a witness for A and a witness for B that are disjoint. So these two sets of edges are going to be disjoint. Okay. What the BK inequality says is that if A and B are increasing events, then the probability of the disjoint occurrence is bounded by the product of the probabilities. Okay, so you should think of this disjoint occurrence thing as being that A and B both occur, but for kind of disjoint reasons. And of course, you know, you're allowed to apply this where A and B are the same event as well. So, you know, for example, if, if A is this event, X is connected to Y, then this disjoint occurrence would be the event that there exist two disjoint paths connecting X to Y. Right? And the BK inequality would say that the probability of this two disjoint paths event is bounded by the square of the probability that X is connected to Y. Okay. So the first thing we'll do for our sharpness proof, so we want to show that these, this new version of the critical probability is equal to the original one. And if we're below it, then we have finite expected plasticities. So, um, so here's the first step. So if P is strictly smaller than tilde PC, okay, then by definition, there exists some finite set S, which contains the origin and has phi P of S strictly less than one. Okay. Now let's notice that if we take a vertex X, which doesn't belong to S, and suppose that this event holds that the origin is connected to X by some open path. Okay, well, this path must leave S for some first minute, right? So we get some piece of the path going up until it first leaves S, and then it goes to X. Well, maybe this is a slightly like non-generic non picture. I mean, maybe the path goes in and out of S multiple times. But there'll be some piece of the path up until it first leaves us. Okay. And then, so the portion of the path up until it first leaves S and the portion of the path after it takes that first edge will be disjoint. Okay. So what we get is that this event is contained in the union over the edges in the boundary. So this would be here. Okay of the disjoint occurrences, first that the origin is connected to the start point of this edge inside S, then that this edge is open, and then that the end point of this edge is connected to X. Okay. And so, you know, what we're saying is that if the origin is connected to X, then there must exist an edge E so that we get disjoint witnesses for these three. Okay. Now what we can do is use the BK inequality. So we get that the expected volume of the cluster is the origin, but it's equal to sum, just by linearity of expectation, it's equal to the sum over X of the probability that the origin is connected to X, okay? So we can bound this by, well, if X belongs to S, let's just keep it the same. Otherwise, X doesn't belong to S, we get this uh, thing, we just use the union bound and the BK inequality to bound by P, which comes from this event that E is open, times this probability here that the origin is connected to S inside, uh, the origin is connected to the start point the edge inside S. And then we finally get that the, that the other end point of E is connected to X. Okay. But the point is that this thing here is just phi P of S, and this sum here I can bound by just another copy of this, okay? So you get that the expected uh, volume of the cluster of the origin is bounded by the size of S, just as a crude amount for this term, plus phi P of S times another copy of the same thing, okay? And if you arrange, if you rearrange, you get that the expected volume of the cluster of the origin is bounded by the volume of S over one minus phi P of S. Now, really, I haven't done this properly because, of course, another solution to this inequality is just that this is infinite. Okay? So, so, in some sense, this proof I've just given you is, is totally nonsense. But 
it's not too hard to fix this. All you have to do is do everything inside some finite region. And then instead of looking at, so, uh, so you work inside some finite set of vertices. And you look at supremal expected cluster size. So supremum over the over the vertex is cluster you're looking at. Okay. And then once you do that, you see that the same argument goes through in exactly the same way, but now instead of looking at the susceptibility, you're looking at this supremal expected cluster size of a cluster of V, supremum over V inside this finite set lambda. You get the same inequality though, and then of course you just take lambda and then you take an exhaustion and you recover this inequality, but proven properly. So what this shows you is that if you're below tilde PC, then you have finite expected cluster size. In particular, we learn immediately that tilde PC is smaller than PC. Because of course, if we're above PC, we have an infinite cluster with positive probability that the expected size of that cluster is, is not. Okay. And now to finish the proof, we need to prove that this equality basically, that tilde PC is actually equal to PC. So we need to prove that if P is bigger than tilde PC, then we have an infinite cluster with positive probability. Okay, and um, to do this, let's introduce another important basic tool in percolation, which is called Rousseau's formula. So let's suppose that we have some event A, which is increasing and depends on most finitely many edges. So for example, the, the event that we'll apply this to is the event that the origin is connected to the boundary of some fault. So of course, when you have such an event A, then the probability uh, that A occurs is just some polynomial in P, right? because you could, you could sum over every specific configuration that's on these edges that you depend on, and you just get some polynomial in P. So in particular, this uh, function, considered as a function of P, this probability is going to be different. Okay. And Rousseau's formula says that we can express the derivative of this event when A is increasing um, as the sum over edges in our graph of the probability that E is pivotal to the event A. Okay, so what does it mean to be pivotal? Suppose that I give you the percolation configuration on every edge other than E, okay? Then E is said to be pivotal if given all that information, whether A occurs or not actually depends on what E is. Okay, so we are given it the status everywhere else and we find that turning E on causes the event to hold and turning E off causes A not to hold and we say that P is pivotal. Okay. Um, so for example, um, if you if you just wanted to, if you took a bunch of ID coin flips and you, your event A was just that the more heads than there are heads, then um, usually you have no pivotals, but there's an event where um, you know where where the uh, where you have let's say you have an odd number of uh, individuals and you have only one more head than tails, then in fact every head is going to be pivotal because if you flipped it to be tails, there'd now be one more tail than other heads. So generally we get that this sum, the derivative of the probability of A is equal to this sum of pivotal probabilities. Um, one nice thing to notice is that the event that E is pivotal to A is actually independent of whether whether E itself is open or closed, right? because that's just irrelevant to the definition. We can also express the probability 
the, the derivative, sorry, as one over one minus p times the probability that p is ellipsoidal of a that's closed. And then obviously you could do a similar thing, some of the open pivotals, and then you get a factor of one over p. Now, what we claim uh, to complete this sharp integral, let's look at the derivative of the probability that the origin is connected to the complement of the ball of radius r. Okay, um, so what we claim is that this derivative uh, satisfies this inequality, that it's at least, um, well, one minus the quantity we're interested in divided by p times one minus p times this thing, which is the infimum of phi p of s over all finite sets s. Okay, now, why is this true? Well, um, let's condition on the set of vertices that are connected to the complements of the ball. Okay, so maybe this is the ball here, and I have, you know, all these. Maybe it looks something like this that I have these points that are kind of near the boundary. They're connected, connected to the complement of the ball. Maybe something like that. Same. Okay, and um, then what we have is, um, well, if we condition on that, then we haven't revealed any information about what the edges are inside the complement of that set. So, you know, we know that uh, if we have a vertex which belongs to, oops, which belongs to that set, but its neighbor doesn't belong to that set, then clearly the edge connecting those two vertices must be closed. Right? So we get this kind of interface of closed edges on the boundary, which are drawn in red here. Okay. But the edges that really belong to the interior of this complement, we don't know anything about them. They're still just IID, right? Because we could explore this cluster of the that we could explore this set of things that are connected to the outside of the ball in some sequential way, like we did before, where we just you know, keep, keep exploring edge by edge, and we'll just never query these edges that are inside the interior. So let's take S to be this interior set of vertices, i.e. just the complement of the things that are connected to the complement of the ball. Okay. Um, so what we get is that, well, if we condition on the origin not being connected to the complement of the ball, then again, the stuff that goes on inside this set S is still just, you know, normal IID population, right? And well, how many pivotals are there? Well, an edge here is going to be pivotal exactly when the origin can connect to the endpoints of that edge inside the set S, okay? And what that means, if you think about it for a minute, what you get is that the conditional on this set and on the origin not belonging, not being connected to the complement of the ball, the conditional expected number of closed pivotals is just exactly one over p times phi p of s. Okay, because it's just the sum of those probabilities that we that we define as pivotals. Okay, now. From this, you actually just immediately get this inequality because okay, this set S is random, but of course, this quantity has to be lower bounded by whatever the infimum is, right? So, so you just bound this by the infimum, you take expectations, and you get the inequality that you want. Okay. Now, once you have this differential inequality, you can just integrate it. You just so we know that if P is bigger than tilde PC then this is lower bounded by one, right? So we get that uh, the derivative is at least this factor one over P one minus P, which it doesn't really matter very much, times the one minus the same probability that we differentiate. Okay, and if you differentiate this, what you learn is that 
the probability, I mean, if you, sorry, if you integrate this, this differential inequality, what you learn is that the probability that the origin is connected to the complement of the boundary of the ball of radius r is at least p e minus cos pc over p e one minus cos pc. Okay, so this inequality holds for any p that's strictly larger than tilde pc and r larger than one. Now, of course, the point is that the right-hand side here just doesn't decay as r tends to infinity. So this quantity on the right-hand side must also be a lower bound on the probability that the cluster of the origin is infinite. Okay? So in particular, if we're above tilde pc, we have a positive probability that the cluster of the origin is infinite. So we have tilde pc must be equal to pc. This concludes the proof of sharpness. Okay. And um, notice that this uh, sharpness proof, it tells you something else as well. It tells you that if your epsilon above criticality, then the density of infinite clusters must be at least order epsilon. Okay. So as I said, this sharpness theorem, I'm sorry. So I, I, I only explained how to prove the, um, this part of the theorem that you have finite expectation. The, the, it turns out that there's a general method for deducing this exponential tail once you know that the expectation is finite. Um, I, I think that uh, I won't go over this. Do we have time for other things? Okay, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see shortly that there are some very nice applications of this sharpness theorem to prove things about population on non linear networks. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to start discussing is uh, the uniqueness and non-uniqueness in the supercritical regime. Okay. So again. We have by definition of PC that when we're below PC, there are no infinite clusters. When we're above PC, there's at least one infinite cluster. Then, of course, it's a very natural question. When you're above PC, do you just have one infinite cluster, or do you have you know, five or infinitely many? You know, how, so how many how many infinite clusters are there above PC? Now, the first basic theorem in this direction by Newman and Shulman in the early 80s says that if you have a transitive graph, then either you have zero, one, or infinitely many clusters on the shelf for each peak. Let's see, one out. In the proof, this is very simple. Um, so, first of all, um, percolation being just IID random variables, it's always ergodic. So, if you have a transitive graph, then any event which is uh, invariant when I apply it, symmetries of the graph must have probability zero. Okay. So in particular, it follows that the number of infinite, for each P, you have some number of infinite clusters which cannot be one. So if you have K infinite clusters with positive probability, you must have K infinite clusters with probability one. Okay. So let's suppose the contradiction that there's some k which is strictly between one and infinity, such that we almost surely have exactly k. Well, as we take balls of growing size, then eventually this ball must intersect all the infinite clusters, right? So the R sufficient. Okay, so that means that there exists some R where the ball of radius R intersects all k infinite clusters with probability at least a half. So. Now, in particular, it follows that with probability at least a half, uh, there is no infinite cluster that does not intersect this ball. Okay. Now, notice that this event here is actually independent of what the edges are doing inside the ball, right? Because it's entirely determined by what's outside. You just want to know, do I have a cluster which is entirely outside the ball? Okay, so it's independent of what goes on inside the ball. So it follows that we must have positive probability that this event occurs, i.e., there is no infinite cluster that's disjoint from the ball, and every edge inside the ball is open. 
Okay. But if those two events happen, then we deduce that we must actually just have a unique infinite cluster, right? Because there's no infinite cluster that doesn't match the ball, and every edge inside the ball is open. So all the different infinite clusters that potentially intersect this ball have all been glued together. Okay. So what we've learned is that if there was a positive probability, if we had um, probability one that there are exactly k infinite clusters, then in fact we have positive probability that there's a unique infinite cluster that was this conjugation. Okay. Okay, so so this Newman and Schumann thing it says these, these are the three possibilities. Either we have no infinite clusters on the surely, unique one on the surely, or if there being unique on the surely. So you know the next uh, you know, really one of the most important theorems in this direction is that in the traditional setting of Euclidean lattices, and in fact, more generally for any transitive amenable graph, you cannot have infinitely many infinite clusters. In each P, you either have no infinite clusters or a, or a unique infinite cluster on the shore. Okay? And um, this was first proven by Eisenman, Kessler, and Newman. Uh, and then Burton and Keane came along with a much simpler proof two years later, which is the one most people learn. So uh, what I'm going to do now is sketch for you very briefly how the Burton King proof works. Uh, in fact, the Eisenman, Kester, Newman proof, although it's harder, it actually gives you a lot more quantitative information. And this is something we'll come back to later in the course about how you can use ideas from the Eisenman, Kester, Newman proof, even in the non amenable case, to prove some interesting quantitative things about the population. So, so here's my sketch of the Burton Keene argument. So we want to we want to argue by contradiction. So we'll assume that we have some P and we have infinitely many infinite clusters with probability one. Okay. So what they do is they first argue that if that happens, then with positive probability, we must have what are called trifurcation points. So a vertex is a trifurcation point if it belongs to an infinite cluster. And if I was to delete that vertex from the infinite cluster, then, um, sorry about that, then it would split the infinite cluster into at least three infinite pieces. Okay. So how do you prove that trifurcation points exist? Well, you do some kind of surgery, a bit like what we just saw in the proof of the newman theorem. Okay. You suppose you have you know, three infinite clusters that are that will intersect some ball, and then you mess around opening, forcing some edges to be open, some other edges to be closed, and you can get this transition point to exist with positive probability. Okay. But um, by, uh, by transitivity, sorry, let me just turn it on. By transitivity, right, every vertex has the same probability of being. A trifurcation point. Okay, and it and it's positive. So now what we do is we look at a big box, or well, in ZD we'll take a big box. In the general amenable setting, we'll take what's called a Bonner sequence, so just a big set that has small secondary uh, compared to its neighbor. Okay, and um, by linearity of expectation. Um, Expected number of applications. Let's call this set lambda. So lambda is going to have the pro property that its boundary is much smaller than its volume, right, which exists by immutability. The number of trifurcations must be whatever this positive probability of the origin being a trifurcation is times the volume. Okay, but now it's a combinatorial fact 
that if there exist k bifurcations inside lambda, then um, then there exists a collection k edge disjoints open paths connecting lambda to infinity. Right, so you can see something like that going on here where I have a bunch of trifurcations inside an set lambda, and then I have, you know, each trifurcation has these kind of three infinite clusters hanging off it, and I'm going to get a bunch of these disjoint infinite clusters going off to infinity. Okay, and this combinatorial fact is very easy to prove, and it's a nice exercise to think about it. Um, good. So what we get, of course, is we get a constriction because this means that the number of trifurcations is bounded deterministically by the size boundary of lambda, right? Because if I have this set of disjoint parts going off to infinity, I certainly cannot have more parts in the set than there are edges in the boundary of the set lambda, right? Because each path must start with one of these edges. Okay. So, so the point is that if I take this big set lambda with boundary much smaller than its volume, then I just must get a contradiction of these two inequalities. Like the, the trifurcations is both comparable to the volume from below and bounded from above. So this is you know just a quick sketch of how that thing works. It's a super nice argument. I imagine it will be familiar to many of you anyway, but if it's not, you know, go, go have a look and read a proper treatment because it, it, it's really very nice. Okay. So what, what we've learned is that in the amenable case, this uniqueness problem is no longer interesting. We've solved it as either no, no clusters or one. Now what's about in the non-amenable case? Okay. So, it turns out that in general, the situation is, is as follows. So we have at most three phases, where first, this first phase is always non-empty. We get up to PC, there are no infinite clusters. Okay. And then what's going to happen is that the supercritical regime, so between PC and one, is going to potentially split up into two further phases. Where first, we're going to get a non-uniqueness phase, and then we're going to get a uniqueness phase. Okay. Now, um, why is this? Well, it's a theorem of Hagster and Perez and Schumann that if G is transitive um, and you have uniqueness at some P, so you have some P where you have a unique infinite cluster on the Scholle, then in fact you're going to get a unique infinite cluster on the Scholle for every uh, Q larger than P as well. Now, this is a non-trivial, it's a highly non-trivial theorem because, of course, this event that, that, that you have a unique infinite cluster is not an increasing event. Right? You can certainly you know, have some unique infinite cluster, and then I increase P a bit, and maybe, you know, maybe over here, some new infinite cluster emerges. Right? So this, is, this event, a priori, it's not an increasing event, so you need to do some kind of non-trivial argument. But once you have it, it establishes what I was just saying, that the phase diagram has most of these three phases and in this order. So you don't have some oscillation between uniqueness and okay. So before I go further, just some more remarks about this. So first of all, this theorem, you know, it doesn't tell us, oops, it doesn't tell us that these phases are non-empty, right? So it might be that so for example, on a three regular tree, we just never have uniqueness except when P is equal to one. Right? Because whenever we delete an edge, but we're above criticality, so what we can have, we'll always have infinite clusters on both sides of that edge. So PU, which is defined to be the boundary point between these two phases is always going to be equal to one 
Okay, but for other examples, we really do have all three phases. So, for example, um, just to mention, so So if you look at the tessellation of the hyperbolic plane, then this has all three phases and it has um, no infinite clusters at PC and a unique infinite cluster here. This is a theorem of Benjamini and Tran. Okay. Um, so, so that's an example where you get all three phases and you get uniqueness at P. Um, so we'll see in a bit that there's no unique clusters at PC thing. That's something we expect very generally, although, for example, in three-dimensional lattices, things like that, it seems to be a really hard problem. In these kind of infinite dimensional settings, like non-nimble things, we actually understand this really well. Uh, I'll talk about this more later. We never have an infinite cluster at PC. On the other hand, understanding what goes on at the uniqueness threshold at PU seems to be a really hard problem. There's hardly any results on it, actually. So it does depend, it really depends on what the graph is. So so as I just said, for tessellations of the hyperbolic plane, it's the theorem of Benjamin and Schramm that you have a unique infinite cluster at PU. But actually, in many other examples, you have non-uniqueness at PU. So for example, this is conjectured, but not known to hold for higher dimensional hyperbolic lattices. Um, but it's known to hold, for example, lines and Schramm show that if you have a Cayley graph of a group with Kajman property P, then you have infinitely many clusters at PU. Okay. But although there are a few examples where we know one way or the other how it works, there's no general understanding of you know, how, how should you determine which of these two behaviors holds. So this is a really interesting problem. Okay. And um, Again, I'm going to discuss this more in a bit, but you know, one of the really big conjectures in this area is that this middle phase is always non-empty on a on an intermediate on a sorry non-amenable graph. Right? So if you have any transitive non-amenable graph, it's a conjecture of Benjamin and Schramm that PC is strictly less than PU, i.e., you really get a phase where there are infinitely many graphs. Okay, so. Let me, let me give you a proof of, of this uh, uniqueness monotonicity theorem. It's not the original proof, and it's really cheating because we're just going to invoke this extremely powerful theorem of lines and tram. Uh, but just so you know, there are you know, more low technology, more uh, direct proofs available as well. So, but, but let's let's just uh, because this line sham theorem is a great thing to know, and we'll see a nice application of it here. So uh, this is called the indistinguishability theorem. Um, it's actually this proof is only going to work when we have the additional property that the graph is unimodular. Uh, so Miklos already started talking about unimodularity in uh, in his talk. Um, let me just quickly review it again in the context of transitive graphs. Okay, so one thing to say is that unimodularity is really a, a very generic property that holds in most interesting examples of transitive graphs. Okay, so in particular, if you have any amenable transitive graph, or if you have any Cayley graph of a binary generated group, these graphs are always going to be unimodular. Non-unimodular things are things like the another graph, as Mikosh was talking about, as an example of a non-unimodular transitive graph. Things like diesel leader graphs, things like that. Um, the common feature of these non unimodular things is that they tend to have been constructed as counterexamples for something. The most natural things that generally are interested in will be unimodular. Um, so, 
the quickest but least enlightening definition of unimodularity is this one that says that if I take any two vertices u and v, so this is for transfer graphs, and I look at the stabilizer of u, so the, the subgroup of automorphisms fixing u, and I look at the orbit of v under the stabilizer, so look at all the places I can move v while keeping u fixed. So unimodularity says the size of the set of this orbit is the same as if I do it the other way around. Okay, so you can see, for example, this is not the case in the grandmother graph. If you take, if you take u is above v, then you can, if fixing the higher vertex, you can move the lower one around a lot. But if you fix the lower one, the higher one can't move. Okay. Um, the equivalent thing, which is what we sort of almost always use, is that unimodularity is equivalent to the uh, graph satisfying what's called the mass transport principle. Okay, so what this says is that if I take any function from pairs of vertices to non negative reals, which is uh, diagonally invariant, so if I apply the same automorphism of the graph, with both coordinates, then it doesn't change the value of the function. But the mass transport principle says that if I take any such function and I fix this origin vertex and sum over the second vertex, it's the same as if I do it the other way around. So I fix the origin in the second coordinate and sum over the first. Okay, and this is what's called the mass transport principle. Um, and there's also a version of this for unimodular random rooted graphs. So you know, to connect this back to Miklos's talk, a transitive graph is unimodular exactly when, if you consider the random graph, which is just deterministically equal to that massive graph rooted in the arbitrary vertex, then it's unimodular in the sense of the um, So, uh, uh, maybe just to mention one more thing is that unimodularity of transitive graphs is equivalent to the automorphism group being a unimodular group. So if you're familiar with unimodularity from group theory, then that's the way you can say the left and right car measures on the group in the same. Okay. So the large term indistinguishability theorem says that if you have a unimodular transitive graph and you have some kind of property that a cluster, an infinite cluster might have. So A is going to be a set of subgraphs of your graph which is measurable and it's automorphism invariant. Okay. So given such a property, the indistinguishability theorem says that either every infinite cluster belongs to this set A, i.e. have this property with probability one, or every infinite cluster belongs to the complement of A, i.e. does not have that property with probability one. Okay. So for example, so th this is like a very strong form of ergodicity is one way to think of it. So, for example, you might take A to be the event that, or the set of transient subgraphs. So the transient, for example, run and walk. If you run a run and walk on the subgraph, does it visit your, does it visit each vertex finitely often or infinitely? Okay, so the indistinguishability theorem would tell you that either every cluster, every infinite cluster is transient on my surely, or every infinite cluster is recurrent on my surely. Right, and of course, you, know, you can find many, many applications of the indistinguishability theorem by finding different automorphism variant properties. So, indeed, let's see how we can use this indistinguishability theorem to prove uniqueness and monotonicity. Okay. So, let's suppose for contradiction that we have a unique infinite cluster P, but we have some Q that's larger than P where we have infinitely many. Infinite well, if that were the case, then we could look at this percolation with parameter Q. And of course, you know, we, we have this monotone coupling of percolation of parameter Q and parameter P, where um, we keep all, everything that's closed at Q is going to remain closed at P. And then the things that are open at Q, we have to flip these coins with, with these P over Q coins to determine whether they 
get deleted when we go down to P or whether they stay up. In particular, we're doing this uh, independently for, for all the different clusters at Q. So if we had infinitely many infinite clusters at Q but a unique infinite cluster at P, then what would happen is we're independently making these choices of which edges to delete when we go down from Q to P. And we're finding that one cluster that we had at Q is keeping an infinite cluster when we go down to P, but every other cluster is getting demolished into finite clusters. Okay. But of course, we have by a Commodore of zero one law that if you give me one of these clusters at Q, then I can just tell with probability zero one whether it's going to become, whether it's going to still have a, an infinite cluster inside it when I go down to P. Okay. So what we must have is that at Q, there's one infinite cluster that we can just identify this is the one that's going to stay infinite when we go down to P, and all the other ones are going to get destroyed. Okay. But of course, this gives us a contradiction for the indistinguishability here, right? Because you can use this property, right? That performing P over Q calculation on the cluster gives at least one infinite cluster on surely, right? This is an automorphism invariant property of the cluster minus or minus one hand. And we're finding that there's one proper cluster that has it, all the other ones don't have it. So this can't fix the distinguishability. Okay. Um, so so that gives us a proof of uniqueness and autonomity. Okay, at least in the unimodular case. And uh, you, you can, um, it, it turns out you can do similar things in the non unimodular case as well, either using some recent work of Tang, or I should say, or uh, there's also a version of indistinguishability of properties with it. With additional properties, as it were, Chris and Shaman that they use for their uniqueness. Um, in fact, uh, using indistinguishability, you can prove that, or Lyons and Shaman did prove in the unimodular case, that uh, um, non uniqueness at some value of p is actually equivalent to having pairs of vertices where the connection probability is arbitrarily small. Okay. So, the other direct one direction is obvious if you have a unique infinite cluster, then the probability x and y are connected to each other is just at least the probability that they both belong to infinite clusters. And by the FKG inequality, right, that's two increasing events, so it's at least the square of the probability that one vertex belongs to infinite cluster. So if you have uniqueness, if you have a unique infinite cluster, it's kind of obvious that you have non-decayed connection probabilities. Okay? But using indistinguishability, Lyons and Schramm proved in the modular case that in fact it's equivalent. So if you have non-uniqueness, then you can find probabilities where the connection probability is arbitrary small. Okay? And this was extended to the non-unimodular case in, uh, in recent work. Of Okay. And of course, this also gives another proof of uniqueness monotonicity because you know, this right hand side condition that the, um, the infinite connection probabilities is zero, this is clearly is monotone, right? Because this is an increasing event. And uh, so I have monotonicity in P of increasing events. So this gives another So maybe I'll finish uh, today by just, um, yeah, maybe I should finish here actually. So uh, I already told you the big conjecture that we're going to be discussing more is this one of Benjamin and Schramm um, stating that on any transitive non minimal graph, you should have really a non degenerate phase where you can have many different clusters. And then I'll start next time by briefly overviewing uh, some, of the, um, some of the work that's been done on this. Okay, great. So I, I think I'll finish there and um, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, uh, let us thank Tom for the, for the great talk first and we'll take questions later.
Um, yeah, so uh, we we can have some questions. Uh, so please unmute yourself and ask. Uh, you can ask your question directly. Okay, so if there uh, are any questions yet, so maybe I can ask a couple of questions. So Tom, you mentioned, um, so this proof about Eisenman, Barsky, and uh, Menshikov's proof, right? So, so they don't work so nicely for general graphs, unlike uh, Hugo's proof, right? So, um, uh, actually, the, the Eisenman, Barsky proof works fine. Well, sorry, it seemed like you were you were going to say something else, so I'll let, let you finish. Uh, no, so so what I what I meant to say is that uh, is it is it true that uh, but those proofs, do they give some more information uh, about the near critical phase, like critical exponents and things like that, more than what uh, Dominic Kupa and uh, Tassan proof would give? Because they are much more um, involved compared to this uh, visibly simple. Yeah. Um, so I think the answer is that the, the Eisenman Barsky proof gives roughly the same information. Um, it, do, it does tell you some more things, but actually, you can also get those more things using the ideas from the uh from the Dumno Kaplan proof. But for example, it tells you that the uh well, roughly it tells you that the probability of having a cluster of size at least n and criticality is at least one over root n. And, mm -hmm. But that's something you can you can actually also get from the uh um Kaplan proof. The Menchikov proof is interesting. It actually gives some Interesting quantitative information. So for the, the main thing is that the Menchikov proof works by looking at the radius of clusters instead of the volume. So it actually mm -hmm. works in general, but it tells you that the below criticality, the radius has an exponential tail. And uh, the problem is that if you have if you have a graph of exponential volume growth, then that doesn't suffice to tell you that you have planet expected volume. But that exponential tail of the radius, that proof always works. And it tells you various interesting things as well that are different. It just, it turns out that the things you get from it are just, they're never sharp. So although they're interesting quantitative bounds, their interest is a bit limited by them not being sharp. Uh -huh. um, maybe, the, you know, now there's also, I guess, a fourth proof of sharpness based on the OSSS inequality in randomized algorithms that was given by Dumno Kupan, uh, Rafi, and Tassian, right? And, and the main point of that is that it um, generalizes to not to some dependent models, but it actually gives you exactly the same quantitative information as the Mitchkov proof. Like they actually end up deriving the same differential inequality. And um, it turns out that uh, so, so in some of my work, I, I showed that you can do that proof in a slightly different way, where you get even stronger quantitative, quantitative information that's actually very useful for lots of things. Basically, it gives you the same differential inequalities as the Menchikov proof, but applying to the volume instead of the radius. And, um, uh -huh. There's quite a lot you can do with this. Yeah. Uh, uh, any references for that? That uh, strengthening you mentioned, more quantitative version. Yeah, sure. Your... Let me just let me just uh, give you link to the paper in the chat. It's probably the easiest. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I had a question too. So um, uh, we had the exponential decay for uh, the probability that um, the size of the cluster is at least n. Mm -hmm. So for uh, in the subcritical phase. So um, so but what happens at t equal to p c? So um, I guess we know that for I mean exponential uh, graphs of exponential growth rate, it 
but um, yeah. Uh, so, any... so this is this is something I'll talk about a lot more in the coming lectures. But basically, to to briefly answer your question, um, we know essentially that. So first of all, you always have infinite expected volume at criticality, and in fact, you you always have this like one over root n lower bound on the distribution. So it's really heavy tail. Um, and then the interesting thing is to try to really determine exactly what the distribution is in, in examples. And um, the belief is that in high dimensional settings, which includes all these non mutable things, this one over root n lower bound should actually be the correct thing. So the probability that you have at least n vertices in the cluster of the origin should decay like one over root n. This is not known in general in the non amenable case. The best result that we have talked about is that there is some polynomial of that. So you decay most like between one over root 10 and one over n to the epsilon. It should really be this one over root 10 in the, in the dimension. But, but I'll talk about this a lot more in the next few days. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, can I ask a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, you pointed out that uh, the event that there is a unique infinite cluster, that is uh, that is not an increasing event, but yeah. uh, it is increasing in the sense that if you yeah, if you add only finitely many edges, then you still do have a unique cluster, unique infinite sure. cluster. So does that really play a role in there? Or, uh... I don't. I don't think so. It's not really how the proof works. Um, I imagine you can think of other events. I, I don't have an example to hand, but I guess you can think of an example of an event that has that to you, but the probability isn't monotone. Um, yeah, although I can't think of an obvious one. <laughs> but but that that's not really how the proof works anyway. So. I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, one thing to note is that this unique monotonicity certainly isn't true on graphs that aren't transitive. So, for example, if you take, if you take like uh, the cubic lattice and then you attach a binary tree to it, so PC for the cubic lattice is smaller than a half. So when you're between PC of Z3 and a half, you'll have a unique infinite cluster, but then once you go above a half, you'll have non-uniqueness because you'll have these binary tree clusters, so you definitely need to use transitivity somehow. Yeah, any any further question? All right, so I'll, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending. Yeah, and thanks, thanks to the speakers, uh, great talks.